Is there a historical conflict between Islam and the West? My name is Ronnie, a Swedish conservative, and today Raymond Ibrahim will answer that question. Welcome. Raymond Ibrahim, welcome. Hello, Ronnie. Good to be with you. Uh, we're going to talk wi- about your latest book today, but first, uh, since most people here in Sweden does not m- know very much about you, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, sure. Um, I was uh, born here in the United States. My parents uh, come from Egypt. They're Coptic Christians. Um, <clears throat> they immigrated to the United States in the late 1960s, I believe, before I was born. And um, <clears throat> so I grew up with a uh, sort of dual background, uh, you know, immersed in American culture and, of course, English language, but also grew up speaking Arabic and um, familiar with that culture very well. I also traveled back and forth to Egypt and other Middle Eastern regions. Um, <clears throat> later on in college, I, uh, uh, because of this kind of dual background, I had an interest in the uh, nexus uh, of where Islam and Western slash Christian civilization meet. So I actually, um, you know, my degrees are in history, my master, uh, my bachelor's and my master's. I also for a while was studying for a PhD, but uh, you know, life got in the way. I started writing books and getting full-time jobs and I never finished. Uh, it was also in history, and uh, my first, uh, my master's degree was about the first battle, the first major battle uh, between Christian and Islamic civilization, which is the Battle of Yarmouk in 636, so that's my master's thesis. Um, and then after that, uh, as I was writing my master's thesis, the, nine, the attacks of 9-11 happened uh, when I was in college. And so uh, my interests began slowly to shift from historical uh, interactions between the West and Islam to the modern day period. And uh, long story short, I, I applied and was accepted into Georgetown University's Arab contemporary Arab studies. I ended up getting a job at the um, Library of Congress in the Middle Eastern section and division. Um, and there I found uh, these Arabic writings by Al Qaeda that had never been translated. And uh, I'm giving you very brief. So then I, I got an, um, I made a book deal. I translated them. I edited them and annotated them. Um, and, and at that point, I very much kind of changed careers. I got into writing and research. Uh, I became a fellow at a variety of think tanks, publishing articles. Um, then I wrote my second book, Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians. And then um, now I've sort of fallen back to my original interest, which is history. So this new book, um, which I think we'll be talking about, uh, that's coming out, it's called Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West is going back to my original studies from uh, 20 years ago. So now the Battle of Yarmouk, which was my thesis, is uh, a much smaller and uh, very different and less academic version is presented in chapter one. And then in the other chapters, uh, you know, we can talk more about that. I, I get into the book and different battles. But so basically in my background is both on a personal and professional level. I've had a very uh, deep interest in the divide and the interaction between the West and Islam. And I've been more or less working in that field for about 20 years. Very interesting. I have actually read your two earlier books, The Al-Qaeda Reader from 2007 and uh, Crucified Again from 2013. And, you know, The Al-Qaeda Reader was very interesting because you actually translate the letters from Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, to, uh, to to Saudi Arabia, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And bin Laden basically says that real Islam is at war with the West, basically. Yeah, well, that, that was the whole point, you know. Up until then, Al Qaeda had been very prolific in sending open messages to the West, which you know the BBC and all these uh, Western media were always happy to translate and and to convey to a Western audience. And all of these messages basically said that we, as in Al Qaeda, are attacking you because of what you've done to us, because of Israel, because of, I mean it was all a long grievance list. So basically, they're saying if you stop oppressing us, we will stop terrorizing you. Uh, but the 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 writings that I found, which had not been sent to the West, which had not been translated and which were directed to fellow Muslims, uh, said the exact opposite. Now they sounded more like ISIS or the Islamic State. They basically said they, the West, are our enemies because they're kafir or infidel. We have to give them three choices, convert, submit as dhimmis or die, and that whole sort of thing. So that's why I thought it was interesting to show the, the two-faced nature of al-Qaeda in general, and you know, more specifically, all these different Islamic groups that sort of say we're doing what we're doing, terrorism, because you started it, 
but then you find that when they speak to one another, they say, no, it's a, it's a religious Sharia obligation for us to subjugate the infidel. Yeah. And if you look up on history, you know, this is this subjugation is a part of history. And we will go into this uh, a lot deeper soon when we talk about your latest book. But in Crucified Again, you also, you know, uh, you, you also knew you, you have this brief uh, exposition of how Islam has, you know, basically uh, persecuted Christians. And this book was actually written before the real rise of ISIS. It was written mm-hmm. in 2013 and ISIS became uh, the Islamic State, a famous group in 2014. So this was actually before ISIS and you exposed mm-hmm. the persecution of Christians even then. And that's the irony. You know, a lot of people, the popular view is <clears throat> the modern day persecution of Christians somehow begins with ISIS. And then we're told ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. They're a bunch of criminals and terrorists. But like you said, I wrote that book before the rise of ISIS, and you've got literally thousands of different anecdotes from just the, you know, the years before ISIS, from basically 2010, 11, 12, 13, of Muslims doing the same exact thing. Um, so again, it shows you that this issue of persecuting Christians and other minorities is not is not limited to you know the spectacular attacks that you see from ISIS, but it's actually a nonstop kind of under you know, very invisible kind of low level persecution that's just happening all around the Islamic world, wherever they live side by side with Christians. Yeah, deeply rooted in Islamic history. And your latest book is about Islamic history, uh, 14 centuries of war between Islam and the West. And when I was planning this podcast, I was thinking about wars. Why do we have to talk about, you know, war history? But then I thought about the Second World War, the war against Hitler. And, you know, everyone in the West living today, they understand that the Second World War was very important. If Hitler had won the war, uh, the world we live in today would have been very different. And your book basically says that if this and this and this battle against the Islamic civilization had ended differently, then our civilization today would also have been very different. Is that a good um, review, a good, good summary of your book? Sure. Well, you know, <clears throat> what you say is, of course, the point. You know, we have to understand history and especially military history. You know, if you go back to the Greeks and the Romans, history was military history <laughs> because to them what really mattered and what really had a diff- made a difference in the world was wars, you know, for good or bad. And so, you know, the origins of historical writing, you know, let's say with Herodotus and so forth, it was basically to chronicle warfare. Now, when it comes to this uh, to this issue of the Islam, Islam versus the West, this is literally one of the longest wars in history. And it's been very continuous. It's been under the same theme, the same logic. The only difference is the names and the characters have changed. So, for instance, uh, you have the Arab, (coughs) the Arab era. And, uh, you know, you have the Arab conquests in the 7th and 8th centuries and so in 9th centuries. And uh, it's done in the concept of jihad. And then you get, uh, for instance, let's say the Ottomans. Um, and then you have the Tatars or, you know, the Mongols who became Muslim. And you have the Moors in Spain. Now, the problem is in history, each one of these is treated separately and it's been nationalized. So, for instance, uh, when we talk about the Ottomans, it's basically, well, it's an empire called Ottoman and it's a bunch of Turks. And they're just fighting with Europeans, and there's nothing ideological about it because Europeans were fighting each other too, and it's just you know it's just another empire. Same thing with the Moors, same thing with the Arabs. Now, when you dig into the sources, as I did, you find that the rationale that justified, uh, or you know what basically impelled the Ottomans and the Tatars and the Berbers and the Moors and the Arabs and the Saracens, which is basically the the uh, generic word for Muslims or Arabs for the medieval people, was the same exact thing. It was jihad. That's what they said in their writings, in their in the primary historical texts, and that's what made them wage war. And so whether it's the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 AD, or you can fast forward. So let's say the first chapter, that's the main battle I talk about, Yarmouk. And then you fast forward to the last chapter, and the main battle I talk about is the Siege of Vienna in 1683. Now, uh, you know, we've gone now 1,000 years, right? And we have different actors, the, the world has changed, technology, weaponry has changed. But it's the same exact impetus that makes the Arabs attack the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire. They go to them and they say, you have three choices. Our religion says convert, become subjugated, dimmies, or fight to the death. And you fast forward to Vienna, it's the same exact thing. That's what, you know, Karam Mustafa, the Grand Vizier, 
who encircled Vienna. Uh, that was his original message. Um, and so, and in between those chapters, you know, the, the beginning chapter and the last chapter, it's the same exact story. All the battles, man's occurred, all, you know, the crusades and the counter crusades and the reconquista, everything. It's, that's, it's built on that Islamic impetus of jihad and offering the infidels three choices. And if they reject it, then you wage war on them. And I think, I think that is so telling because it's the exact opposite of what we're being told about history. Um, more or less here in the West, at least in America, I, I imagine it's the same in Sweden, maybe even worse, actually. Uh, history has been so whitewashed, and what I'm saying has been completely suppressed. At best, when people talk about the past between Islam and the West, immediately it starts with the Crusades, because in the Crusades you have Westerners actually taking the offensive and marching onto Muslim lands um, and, and doing warfare. But people don't realize, you know, for four or five hundred years before the Crusades, the Muslims completely changed the world. You know, when we say the word the West, uh, what most people don't understand is the West today is literally the westernmost remnant of a much larger and cohesive civilization that Islam completely severed. If you look at it, if you look at the map of, uh, you know, the Christian world, uh, which is the post-Roman Christian world, you have all of North Africa, Egypt, you know, to Morocco, giving it its modern names, Spain and, you know, all of Europe, including Great Britain, um, south and west of the Rhine and Danube and Asia Minor, of course, and, and Syria. These were like these, in fact, were the hearts of Christian uh, of the Christian world, you know, Constantinople. It was the east, Syria, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, all these regions. Now, when Islam came onto the scene, it violently seized all these regions and conquered them permanently so that today, for instance, if I talk about Christian persecution in, let's say, Egypt or Syria, so many Western people will look at me and say, you know, we really sympathize, but why are Christians going and living in Muslim lands? And, you know, and that just shows you the ignorance. They don't understand that these are inherently ancient Christian lands that were conquered by force and held. And so had Islam not come onto the scene and did what it did, really what we call today the West would be would include North Africa and Southwest Asia, which sounds ridiculous today. If you say that, it just doesn't make any sense because we understand how culturally different that region is, but that wasn't the case. In fact, culture, civilization, and Christianity was in the East and in North Africa in that region. It wasn't really so much grounded in Europe as it was there. So really the world has changed because of these Islamic invasions. And in the book, I go into detail on how, you know, the, the, the various in incremental changes and territorial conquests that happened to, to you know, make for this vast change. Yeah. And, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, dive into a, a few of these battles because the Prophet Muhammad, he lived in the seventh century and he waged war against his surroundings, against the Byzantines and the, the Persians. And his first caliphate, the Rashidun Caliphate, they really, really expanded this war. And you begin with that caliphate and a battle called the Battle of Yarmouk, the battle you mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning. Can you can you tell me a little bit about what that battle was about and what the consequences were? Yes, well, uh, to start at the at, at the bottom, you know what the consequences were. There's a lot of uh, historians, and I quote them in a the book, who basically say the Battle of Yarmouk, which I'll discuss, was the most consequential and important battle in all of world history. Okay, and the reason is, um, well, let me actually go back. Having said that, so let me tell you about the Battle of Yarmouk. So when the Arabs, um, after Muhammad died, and under, under the first caliph Abu Bakr, uh, they started, you know, uh, the Arab tribes were solidified, and instead of infighting, as they had always done, you know, tribe versus tribe, now they were one tribe under Islam, the, the Ummah. And so they went out and started attacking, they attacked the uh, Persian, the Sasanian Empire, and of course the Byzantine Empire. But for our purposes, we're looking now at, at the Byzantine Empire. And so they, long story short, they started doing raids, and then Abu Bakr died in uh, uh, 634, and now you have um, uh, Caliph Omar the first Omar, and uh, he is the Rashidun Caliph under whose reign a lot of the uh, conquests occurred. So under his ter under his reign, they went, and uh, long story short, they invaded all these Syrian regions, which of course were part of the Roman Empire and highly Christian, and then the Emperor Heracles. He finally mustered up one of the largest armies to put an end to this, and they met at uh, by the river Yarmouk in Syria. And this and, was the um, year 636, right? Correct, correct, 636. And this is about two years 
after nonstop raids and plunders and also battles. There's the Battle of Ajnadin, for instance, which I think happened uh, two years before Yarmouk, and the Muslims won and uh, really slaughtered the Christians, uh, the Byzantines, so much so that that's why uh, Heracles decided he's going to get as much of a, an ar a large army as he can get to put an end to this. And so they met uh, along the Yarmouk River, and according to the Islamic texts, and that's the problem with this, with this battle, while it's mentioned in uh, Christian chronicles, um, they give it very little uh, the description, uh, details. We don't really know much details, but if you look at the Muslim accounts, oh, it's very long, and I mean, they have it's whole chapters about what happened, but at the same time, it's also a little suspect. It's believed that the Muslim account is very much embellished uh, to make the Muslims look braver than they were or more powerful than they were, etc., because it came out much later than the Christian Chronicle. So really, the first mention of Yarmu comes out in the late 700s, um, even though it happened in the early 600s, 636. Uh, so that's you know something you have to keep in mind. Uh, we, uh, but what's important about this is, and, and I, I get into this in the book. What's important is you know the the Muslim account may be doubted, but at the same time, it's important to understand it because it gives us an idea of how Muslims understand history, because Muslims don't doubt that account. That's the one they believe. So long story short, in that battle, uh, you have all the Muslim leaders telling the Christians, according to Islamic sources, you have three choices. We've come here because, you know, Greek blood or Christian blood tastes the best. And we've given you three choices, become Muslims and we become like brothers, become dhimmis and pay jizya or tribute, or we fight to the death. So that's in the Islamic account. And of course, the, the, the Christians reject that. And they have war, which supposedly transpires over six days. It's a massive war until finally, <clears throat> on the sixth day, the Arab cavalry, uh, you know, outflanks the heavy Byzantine armored men and, you know, maneuvers. And then there's a dust storm and it's dark and the Arabs are used to that sort of thing. Whereas the, you know, European warriors who came from all over the empire were not. And long story short, they get slaughtered and many of them fall over the precipice into the river. And it was a complete disaster. Um, so after that, uh, you know, that was the bulk of the mil of the Byzantine force. So they had to really regroup and retreat. And at that point, it really opened the gates for the Arab armies to flood the, uh, the, the Christian Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And then in a couple of years, they take Alexandria. Uh, Syria gets conquered. Jerusalem, of course, in the, in the year in 637, the year after. Damascus, Antioch, everything starts falling like dominoes, okay, mm. until uh, literally in about three or four decades, they sweep all across North Africa, which I said, you know, today when you think of North Africa, you, uh, you People think it's a third world country you know, or, or region, but it wasn't. That was actually the richest and most important region of the Roman world, the Christian world. Uh, you know, Carthage uh, or Tunisia right now, Carthage, which was uh, what it was called at the time. That's where the Bible was canonized as we have it. You know, the Nicene Creed that was in uh, up there in Asia Minor, Alexandria, that was the, the major ecclesiastical seat of study. Antioch, you know, so there were five centers, the five C's as they're known, Antioch, Jerusalem, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Rome. And before you know it, three of them are gone, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And then, of course, we can talk about later, but then eventually Constantinople also, until today, we're just left with Rome. And so that's why Yarmouk is, uh, you know, believed to be one of the most pivotal and important battles, because it really changed the face of the classical world forever. And now North Africa which used to speak, let's say, Greek. Egypt was very Hellenized. Uh, now they all speak Arabic. They're considered Arabs. They've taken Arabic culture. And when we say the Arab world, we, may all, we mean all of North Africa and Southwest Asia, even though in the seventh century, the Arab world was the peninsula. That's it. That was the only area. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's Yarmouk. So could you summarize by saying that the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 was the battle that made half of the, the whole Middle East Islamic, basically. Oh, yes. Well, basically, after the Battle of Yarmouk, that was the battle that just because the Byzantine Empire got smashed and lost so much power and afterwards more or less went into defensive mode until at least a couple of centuries. Um, yes, three quarters. If you look at the map and a lot of historians have done this, three quarters of what was then the Christian world was forever conquered by Islam. Yeah. And, uh, and this is what I mean. You know, people don't understand that. They think when they think Christianity or Christendom, they think Europe. They don't realize that, well, actually, Christendom was all of North Africa and Southwest Asia. It was the entire Mediterranean basin. 
And the heart of it was in the east. That's why, you know, the Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople or New Rome. Um, and, and Islam had a, uh, you know, had, had a massive convulsion on that whole world and it shattered it. And today, because we don't like to get into this history because it's politically incorrect, uh, people just think, you know, well, Christian civilization was just Europe. <laughs> Uh, and, and Europe is the West. No, it's the westernmost part of Christianity that never got conquered, at least not permanently, because Spain got conquered for centuries, the Balkans and Russia got conquered for centuries, and so, and that's another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of until yeah. they finally fought them off. Yeah, let's let you mentioned Spain uh, after the conquest of of the Middle East, the south side of the of the Mediterranean. Uh, the Islamic forces tried to act and actually succeeded in colonizing Spain. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So after Yarmouk and after all of North Africa falls like dominoes, by uh, right around 709, Muslims are in. An, uh, to give it, it's you know, it's 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 more popular, modern name. They're in Morocco, uh, right across the Straits, the Straits of Gibraltar, which of course are named after the Muslim conqueror, um, Tariq. Um, and they decide now we're going to invade into, into Europe and they go into Spain and they get all these boats and they invade Spain. And, um, and here again, you see the divide between what we're taught, uh, popular history and what the sources say. So the sources say it was just a nonstop massacre. Uh, there, there were burning and Christians alive, placing them in their churches, burning the churches down, destroying churches, raping and enslaving women and children, selling them nonstop for about six years until the country completely capitulated. Um, and at which point now they've moved so far north into Spain that they're preparing to go into uh, France, um, you know, where the Battle of Tours happens soon thereafter. But then you talk to, you know, the popular history and they don't even talk about this initial invasion. It's almost as if the Muslims came in and instantly the Christians uh, surrendered to them because they thought they were so wonderful. And they all developed this great civilization where they just all cooperated. I mean, there's just nothing further from the truth. Um, you know, one one of the more recent and important books that talks about this, uh, Dario Fernandez Morera, it's called The Andalusian Myth, makes this very clear. And he looks into Spanish sources and so forth uh, to show you it was just it was the same thing that was happening in the East. It was jihad, conquest, destruction, uh, and devastation of the land. Um, and this happened. And of course, there was a little holdout. Uh, one, uh, one, one fighter, Paleo, uh, because the final the, the resistance of Spain after it crumbled and fell to Islam, they all went up in the northern regions of Asturias, which is mountainous and very hard to live in. And so the people who chose to remain Christian and free uh, without paying jizya and so forth retreated there and kind of hold themselves up in the mountains. And eventually, under the leadership of Paleo, eventually the Muslims decided we're going to put an end to this and they went there, but they actually lost their first major defeat under Paleo's leadership and he became hailed the new king of Christian Spain, just in that very small little dot. And um, I wrote a recent article on NRO about his story. And uh, when they went to him, uh, you know, a lot of Christians who had capitulated to Islam this went up to him and said, it's pointless, you can't live like this. Surrender, become a dhimmi, do what they want, pay them their tribute, and they'll let you alone. And he basically, it's very heroic, you know, he rejected it, and he quoted Christ saying, this is a mustard seed, this little mountain that I'm in. And from this mustard seed, you will see the kingdom of God reestablished in Spain. And lo and behold, it took about seven centuries. But the Christians from that small hole over the centuries continued advancing and having setbacks back and forth, uh, and uh, but eventually coming all the way down until 1085 when they took Toledo, at which point half of the peninsula was recaptured uh, by the Christians or reconquered, and that's why it's called the Reconquista. But then that went on for centuries. It didn't finish until 1492. When the very last um, Muslim stronghold, uh, Granada, was finally uh, uh, captured by Ferdinand and Isabella, yeah. um, so that, you know there's another history where the bulk of it is violence, bloodshed, anti-infidel hostility, and so forth. But today, when you talk about Islam in Spain, it's presented as this wonderful, glorious epic, and how we can all learn so much from it. And it's just not because even the people that they cite, let's say Abdul Rahman the Third. He's, he, he's, he reportedly is the main guy that's part of this golden era. Well, you look at his biography and he's, he tortured his, his sex slaves. He murdered a boy because he wanted to rape him. He threw acid on a woman's face because she didn't want to submit to him. He had them decapitated. I mean, it's the, it's the same story. 
um, and e even in that very small epic. And yet that small epic has been cleaned, you know, whitewashed and presented as the main history. And then the main history, 700 years of constant warfare, has been sidelined. Very interesting. Before we go into the next battle, uh, I have one question. Is Spain mm. the only example where, you know, a Reconquista has succeeded? Because I can't actually think of any other country where Islam have, you know, been occupying for 700 years and then the Christians have returned. Well, Spain is certainly the most, um, you know, I think of Spain as, or the Iberian Peninsula as a sort of microcosm. Uh, it's like a perfect little snapshot in a very small, localized, closed arena of Muslims and Christians warring nonstop, which is uh, reflective of the larger, you know, Europe versus Islam and so forth. But it's very localized and it's very sharp and focused. Um, but there were, of course, other Christian territories that were conquered and they did liberate themselves. For instance, all of the Balkans um, under Ottoman rule. You know, some countries were like Serbia. They were under Ottoman Islamic control for centuries. Um, you know, Hungary and Greece and, and also Russia was under the so-called Tatar yoke, which uh, was Islamic. Uh, when the Mongols first invaded and conquered Russia, they weren't Muslims, but they soon became Muslim. And instantly you get that same, you know, Islamic hostility for infidels creeps up and you see it in the accounts. So um, I even have a map in the book where I show three phases. You know, I have Europe and North Africa and um, I show black shaded regions are the areas that were formerly Christian became permanently conquered. So that's North Africa. Egypt, Syria, and Anatolia. But then I have gray to show you all the areas that were temporarily conquered, often for centuries, and that would be Spain, all the Balkans, Russia, and so forth. But I also have shaded lines to show you where the raids went. Now the raids, these go all the way to Iceland. Uh, there's raids in Denmark and Ireland and Great Britain. Um, and, and, and surely there might have been in Sweden and Norway and so forth, but of course our records are very uh, uh, patchy from this era. So who knows? But They went, if they could get as far as Iceland, you know, how far, you know, where couldn't they get? So if you look at this map that I created, really the only area that's not colored, meaning has not been attacked by Islam, is, is Central Europe or basically Germany, um, you know, and, and uh, maybe parts of Scandinavia. And I think, you know, part of me, uh, I want to say that one of the reasons that those are the countries that are have a sort of favorable attitude towards Islam is because they don't have a history with Islam, you know, Germany and most of Scandinavia. They don't have that long history uh, that maybe Hungary and Poland and Serbia and Spain do, uh, which gives them a little, you know, vision about the past and former relations. So I think that's what, you know, for lack of a better word, creates a bit of naivety in a lot of these sort of Western European nations. They don't have this history that we're discussing. Very interesting. There is no time to go into all the battles, but, you mm -hmm. know, we have the Crusades and we have, you know, the Battle of Vienna. Sure. And there are a lot of battles and all these battles was very important for mm -hmm. uh, sometimes because, you know, Christianity lost, but also sometimes Christianity defended itself. And, you know, the northern part of the Middle East, Europe, survived as a Christian continent. So that is basically... Like I said in the beginning, World War Two. everyone know that the Second World War was very, you know, uh, very important. Mm -hmm. our, our whole world today depends on World War Two, And, you know, our whole world today also depends on this battle against Islam. And, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to summarize, uh, or actually, most, most of our, uh, the things you're saying now, most of our uh, academics, of the academics of our time, they... Don't they, they, they don't agree with you. They say that there is no such a thing as a clash of civilizations. And, you know, drawing from your studies, do you have any opinions about that academic claim? Well, first of all, because I'm familiar with that academic claim and, I, and I'm wary of it, in my book I have well over a thousand citations and references. So I'm showing you, you know what, I'm not the one who's making this argument. It's other people. And most of the, the references are actually primary sources. So I quote the Christians and the Muslims uh, from the past who say it is a class of civilizations, but as well as a number of, you know, uh, more reliable secondary historians and so forth. Um, but of course, I am aware of this idea. And, uh, you know, going to your point, you're talking about it's important. We need to know history and we need to know World War Two and so forth. Um, I agree with that. But in this particular case, it's, there's one more important reason for us to know it. And, uh, you know, whereas one can argue, well, World War Two is over and it's history and it doesn't really you know, necessarily affect how things are happening today. Of course, you know, I don't, I'm not arguing that's the case. Um, but in this particular uh, history, 
we are continuously being told that the Islamic State, ISIS, have nothing to do with Islam. Well, in this history, I show you Muslims behaving just like ISIS and on the same rationale of jihad for over 1,200 years, all documented. You know, I go all the way up until America before it had its first president, before they could elect George Washington. Its very first war, once it declared itself as a nation, was with Muslims who attacked it in the name of jihad uh, on the high seas. And when Thomas Jefferson and John Adams met with the ambassador of Barbary, um, he told them the same exact thing. In our religion, you are a kafir, you're an infidel, you're an unbeliever. It's our right to attack and plunder and enslave you until such time as you become a Muslim. <laughs> That's what he told them. So I think the additional important point in this book, and one of the main reasons I wrote it, is for people to understand when ISIS is not an aberration. In fact, it's a perfect continuation of Islamic history, contrary to what they keep telling us. Very interesting. But when we know this, when we know that ISIS is like, it has a lot to do with Islamic history, what should be our conclusion? What should we do with that knowledge? What should well, be, you what, know, yeah. yeah. Well, once you, once you make that conclusion, I believe the, you know, the, the policies or, the, or, or, or what people will do should become self-evident. You know, up until now, for instance, uh, open door mass migration of Muslims into, let's say, you know, Sweden, for yeah. instance. Um, this is happening on the on the belief that there is no clash of civilizations, on the belief that Islam has nothing against the non-Muslim, it treats them with perfect respect and so forth. Well, if you find out that a lot of what's happening is actually ideologically and religiously inspired, well, maybe that should have an impact on your policies vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for instance, open door migration and so forth. But uh, but up until now. I, I imagine most people in Sweden are convinced that what's happening has nothing to do with religion. Uh, maybe it's because they're oppressed, economically frustrated, et cetera, et cetera. It's our fault and so forth. Um, so they keep they keep the open door policy open, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but if you understand, no, this has been going on. I, I mean, in, in the book, I show you, for instance, how one of the main things and one of the main incentives of Islam from the very beginning was to go abduct and enslave white people, fair-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed, Swedish types, and enslave them. And, uh, you know, from the very start, there was this was a, a, a premium in the Islamic slave markets. They fetched the highest price. Um, there is even an argument that the entire Viking phenomena, where, whereby Vikings in, you know, in the 9th and 10th and so forth centuries raided and enslaved, um, you know, fellow white people, but who were Christians in England and so forth, was 100% because the Arabs were paying them top dollar to bring them these slaves. And so when you understand that long history, you start understanding, well, maybe that's why what's happening is still happening uh, to a degree. I mean, I'm sure there's all there's all kinds of modern day factors that need to be factored in, but I don't think this continuity should be ignored when it's so evident. Exactly. Um, the lack of knowledge creates bad policies. I think yes. that's, that's what you could say. All right. Absolutely. Well, all right. Uh, thanks a lot, Raymond Ibrahim. Uh, your book is called 14 Centuries of War Between Islam in the West. So thanks a lot for taking time. Yeah, it's called Sword and Scimitar. And then the, the subtitle is oh. 14 Centuries of War, war uh, Between Islam and the West. But that's fine. Yes. And, and it will, <laughs> it's not released yet, right? No, it's coming out in August, but you can, uh, you, it can be pre-ordered right now on Amazon. And you'll get it the day it gets released. Great, great. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Sure. Thank you.